While part of the Soviet Union, Georgia has proved its unique and independent spirit by performing as a hotbed for highly distinctive and naturally outstanding filmmakers, its capital city Tbilisi even becoming the birthplace of Armenian artist extraordinaire and groundbreaking director Sergei Parajanov. It's likely that names such as Revas Chkheiz, Mikhail Chaurelli, Tengi Zabulatze, and Otar Yoseliani will be completely unfamiliar to the majority of film viewers, even though these can easily be classified as the cream of the crop of Georgian classical cinema and are therefore included in the gallery of honor of Soviet film directors too. Of these, Yoseliani might be the more famous and recognizable name in the Western Hemisphere, given his extensive work outside the Soviet Union, more precisely in France where the director emigrated during the 80s. Yoseliani studied in the highly prestigious VJIK school in Moscow, also known as the Gerasimov Institute of Cinematography, under the guidance of Chiarelli and Alexander Dovzhenko, the Ukrainian director responsible for the masterpiece Earth, which has been analyzed on the previous video. His debut feature film, that earned the Fipresci Award at Cannes in 1968, is called Falling Leaves and is regarded as one of the many great Soviet films from the 60s, a pristine depiction of Georgian cosmopolitan life under Soviet domination. The reason why this film is catalogued as a Georgian masterpiece, despite being a product of the Soviet Union era, is grounded on the fact that it portrays a specific reality that is markedly different from what one would identify as the Russian Republic in the Federation, both in terms of culture and language, but also because the cast, crew and production companies are entirely of Georgian origin. The film opens with documentary-like pastoral scenes of winemaking in the Georgian countryside that illustrate various stages of the production and the eventual consumption as well, of the divine beverage that is so strongly associated with the Georgian lifestyle and history, which can be explained by the fact that the country comprises one of the world's oldest wine regions and by the reputation of Georgian wines which has been established for centuries, being especially well regarded in the Soviet Union where it was esteemed and cherished as the finest available in the area and therefore much looked after. Observing how the agricultural society approaches the act of winemaking and how it connects during and after its production, joining family and friends in a sacred ritual that stands perhaps as the backbone of the community, acts as a great counterpoint for the remainder of the film. The great Georgian poet Nikolaos Baratashvili describes in his poem Chinari the essence of what it is to work in connection with nature. After this introduction on the Georgian countryside, the film then moves on to its main setting. Falling Leaves tells the story of two friends and their early days as workers in a wine collective in Pilisi, how they tread their work path and develop personal relationships, with different results stemming from their disparate personalities, ambitions, work ethic and emotional maturity. The narrative centers itself specially on Nico and at its core, one could actually define Falling Leaves as an adulthood tale of emotional and intellectual growth that resonates especially due to its poignant sensibility and daring political conscience, showcasing a director with a brave and cultured understanding of the life in a society flawed on several levels. Right from the start, Nico and his friend Otar present themselves as having widely dissimilar attitudes to life and personalities. Nico hails from a large family with tight, affectionate bonds and amenable disposition, whereas Otar is depicted as a product of a much stricter couple with modern expectations and urban customs. Nico appears as laid-back and might come across initially as somewhat shoddy and careless in his demeanor, while Otar is seen as more mature and professional in his approach to life. However, these first impressions are quickly shunned once we get to know them more profoundly. As days progress, Nico turns out instead to be quite a knowledgeable and sensible young man with wise palate, a brave and honorable individual, proven by his firm rejection to sign the documents that would allow the wine collective to bottle and put out a less than satisfactory wine for the sake of fulfilling the quotas imposed by the Soviet state. Conversely, Otar comes off as a spinal servile and sycophantic lackey that submits himself completely to the establishment in order to quickly move up the corporate ladder and to unworriedly chase skirts on the side. Naturally, Nico gets in trouble, not just at work because of his noble character and conscientious ethic, but also suffering disappointment on a romantic level. The bravery displayed by Nico on a wine-tasting meeting with the other lab workers and the collective's director, which is afterwards acknowledged privately by the boss himself, and the respect he earns from the vintners which unofficially adopt him as one of them, and albeit being older and of a lower status, bear much more experience and expertise than their superiors, clash intensely with the disillusion that befalls him when confronted with the corrupted apparatus of Soviet governance 
and the true nature that belies his love interest, a charming but self-conscious girl with unfortunately fleeting interests and a possessive suitor always on the watch in a nearby corner. The modern life in the city and its dwellers forcefully teach Nico a lesson on how to come of age by setting the free and autonomous individual against an oppressive and conformist society, quality and substance on one side, quotas and superficiality in the opposition, pitting tradition against modernity, requiring to choose between honesty and deceit, a struggle that establishes the character of those who face the turmoil that underlies every choice and which ultimately defines the world in which they live in. For as the characters in Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov come to realize, we are all guilty for everyone else. Through the decisions we take and the examples we give, it is our responsibility to lead our kin by extolling virtue, truth and compassion, or to contribute to the disintegration by wallowing in self-interest, falsehood and indifference. The moment we succumb to blindly following orders, or sheepishly echo the rabble, is the moment we cut ourselves away and rip the communal fabric that permits us to live together in an honest and fair society that seeks excellence and dignity for all. Hence why Nico's audacity is so impressive, for when he decides to ignore the orders from the director and his superiors and adds gelatin to the wine in the cask that is about to be bottled and sold, he does so inspired by his integrity, rejecting the senseless corporate dates and obligations with the aim of upholding the collective's own principles and preserving the client's trust. This confrontation, perhaps an unwilling but necessary step in his development, affects Nico to the point of turning him sour during what would be a typically merry meal with his family, as displayed during his introduction in the film, but on the other hand, serves to further reinforce his belief in doing what he considers to be right. A step that transforms him from a fledgling to a fully developed creature ready to take responsibility for his actions, and a verse from Simon Cicovani's poem, Cartley and Evenings, alludes to that in a glorious manner. Falling Leaves accordingly acts as an eloquent meditation from a purely intellectual point of view, without falling into a rigid black and white dualist rebellion that could be taken as reverse propaganda, its perceived contrasts acting instead as a mechanism that frames within itself the solutions that entail a compromise between opposites, thus offering the possibility of resolution that is based on foundations that are adequate whatever their space and time. It's a dialogue that is as intellectually stimulating as it is aesthetically skillful being supported by superb black and white photography that makes great use of composition in a consistent manner, while exhibiting an incredibly bold and inventive disposition, as it strings many more or less conspicuous tracking shots, occasionally combined with much creative zoom and crane use, that will appeal to viewers fond of lyrical film styles that aim to capture the pace and music that accompany life of every sort, especially at youth, but which are completely invisible to a mundane outlook. Periodically, the camera will step out of carefully blocked fixed shots and revolve around characters on a cafe table or follow workers on their live shift, slowly slide into a family dinner or shift from the open air street into a cozy indoor bedroom, among other shots operating under handheld or dolly mounted motion. In other words, a viewer that appreciates films exploring spaces and moods with a delicate eye in mind making full use of the camera's technical capabilities to evoke a sublimated poetical atmosphere, will find Falling Leaves to be a substantially heartful experience, and therefore an impressive feature to boot at that, bringing Yoseliani to the group of Soviet filmmakers that have dared to look beyond the guidelines of social realism and associated ideological framework, people such as Dovzhenko, Parajanov, Ilyenko, Abuladze, Tarkovsky, Peleshian, Artists that have endeavored to provide an artistic vision that transcends the trivial, short-sighted and insipid elaborations of conventional cinema. Do make sure to keep an eye on this channel for future videos on more masterpieces of world cinema and various videos on film theory, acting, in-depth analysis and other film-related content. If you learned something meaningful from this video, feel free to like it, comment, share and subscribe to the channel. Thank you and see you next time.